So welcome back to The Defiant Spirit. I am uh, excited to be continuing this conversation with my good friend and now partner in podcasting, at least on this part two, Scott Schaffman. Hey, brother, how are you doing? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. You know, you're back by popular demand. I got oh. a lot of a lot of feedback on our first podcast. I hope you got some good feedback, too. I, I did. I hope uh, I hope I don't disappoint this time around. <laughs> Uh, I think uh, by the nature of who you are and what we were talking about, uh, there's no disappointment. It's really inspiring stuff. So just to remind our uh, viewers who, who are either watching us, we're both uh, on video as well as uh, many different podcasting platforms. Our first conversation, uh, I named it A Path with Heart, um, partially because I had just read this great book, <clears throat> excuse me, by Jack Cornfield called A Path with Heart. But more importantly, because when I read it, I thought of my friend Scott, who I do a lot of work with as well, um, uh, which you can listen to that first podcast, sort of the nature of our work together, the journey that Scott's made over the past 50 years. It's all summed up in about a half hour. So we definitely didn't do justice to his entire journey. But we've done, I think, I think we did pretty good justice to the past couple of years and the transformation you've gone through. Did you feel like it sort of captured the essence of, of the last couple of years? Yeah, I, I absolutely do. You know, I just think that, you know, we've um, we talk, you know, w once a week and a lot of these conversations that we've had in the past just kind of they just happen. Um, there's no direction. There's no plan. So, um, you know, what we discussed last time um, was just me being myself at that point in time and, and in the moment. Um, I don't, I'll be honest, I don't necessarily remember exactly what we talked about. So, um, but I, uh, I'm looking forward to, you know, going down this road again today and seeing how this transpires. Yeah, me too. I, I always kind of go back to Maya Angelou, who said something, I'm going to paraphrase her, but she said something to the effect of, you know, it's not what was said or what people say, it's how they made you feel right? This is what you carry. I can't remember, you know, most of the conversations. I don't know if it's a function of age <laughs> or my Y chromosome or just my Enneagram eight or just living and being human, but it doesn't matter because I walked away from that conversation. I think others walked away and all of our conversations feeling different, right? feeling You're different, feeling whole. And that's what I wanted to kind of orient ourselves around today is this idea of wholeness, because we talk a lot about it. We may frame it in the um, language of authenticity, your whole self, being wholehearted is a word we've used a lot before. Uh, but I, I love this word wholeness. Another word that I use is integrity, but not, um, well, I'm going to share uh, just a little bit from a teacher of mine named Parker Palmer. Parker is a, a great man, a great author, prolific, um, comes from the Quaker tradition, wrote a, many books. My favorite is A Hidden Wholeness. And um, in it, he talks about what does wholeness mean? This was kind of the precursor to the Brene Brown wholehearted movement. And he says the following, there is in all things a hidden wholeness, but in the human world, at times this sounds like wishful thinking. Afraid that our inner light will be extinguished or our inner darkness exposed, we hide our true identities from each other. In the process, we become separated from our own souls. We end up living divided lives, so far removed from the truth we hold within that we cannot know the integrity that comes from being what you are. And when I say integrity, and when we talk about wholeness, and, and in our work together, this paragraph really touches on that experience for me how do you feel about it yeah i mean i think um you know i've been going through this journey over the last two years and it's um i'm gonna uh talk about what i i was enlightened a little bit this morning and i don't know if this is gonna talk you know necessarily answer this question or not but i was at the gym and we've talked um about this in the past where it's like, oh my God, I had, you know, this day and then I had to wake up and start this day, you know, the next day. And how do you stay centered? How do you, how do you take today's enlightenment and transfer it to tomorrow's enlightenment? And I struggle with that because I wake up every day and it's just like, oh my God, it's a, it's a new day. I have to do this process, this again. I have to try to get centered. I have to, you know, try to be 
my my true authentic self and it and it's not um it's become easier on a daily basis but as i was working out today i realized that it just kind of came to me that i really enjoy my morning routine i feel like that's that's my time to get centered so instead of me having this outlook of why do i have to you know go through this journey every single day instead of going about it that way going about it um of enjoying that journey every day enjoying being as present as i possibly can be as centered as i possibly can be and it takes that morning routine to get you in that mindset i know you wake up very early in the morning to try to get you in this in this right mindset this mantra you do your meditation you read you journal um and i think that that's in order to for us to be centered and to in order for us to be our true authentic self it takes that piece every day and falling in love with that piece as well that's really it's great insight i just worked on like five different little nuggets or sparks that we can really pull out of that um the first for me when you're talking about it is a question and the question is we all have it is this supposed to be this way is this you know normal right shouldn't i be enlightened and if i've achieved enlightenment if i if i've had a moment of awakening why do i go back to sleep and, and so the question really is is it supposed to be this way we all deal with that by the way i've sat in meditation almost every day almost every day for coming up on 20 years probably almost every day and my baseline is to get back to bring down the noise not become the buddha right can i just get backward to a moment when i can stop thinking and just be fully present every single damn day it's so hard <laughs> and when i'm when i would, and it's easier that you do it at home when i'm at the gym you think about all of these distractions you have these the pretty people everywhere right they're everywhere and the tvs there's you know 10 tvs going you have the music going um your screen if you're working out the monitor you know whatever is being played there and displayed um the people that are next to you coughing gross okay <laughs> um you know so all these different distractions and here i am just i'm watching this uh this thing on masterclass, Amy, my wife bought me this subscription to masterclass and this guy, this guru was talking about just being present and being present in every, and trying to just um, stay, you know, as focused as you possibly can in the now, right? In this moment right now, boy. And during this meditation piece that he was going through, he says that it is normal okay to drift away mm -hmm. okay being truly in this meditative state is is nearly impossible it's normal for your brain and your thoughts to start to think about other things but then you get pulled back to being in this in this present moment and he talked about after the meditation process okay so after you're you know in this present space and really thinking about nothing trying to think about absolutely nothing Try to remember what it was that kind of kept creeping into your head and address that. Mm -hmm. But don't do it while you're, you know, trying to be as present as you possibly can with no thought. So, so a lot of important so points hard. you're talking so about. Hard. And one of them is, uh, you know, when I say meditations, oftentimes people kind of just go to a mountaintop in a full yeah. lotus position saying, om, om, om. <laughs> That's not it at Which, all. <laughs> there is no such thing as it's sort of like, you know, love, right? What, what is that? Well, there's different types of love, different expressions. Meditation is now this catch all. And, you know, what you're talking about in Kabbalah, I'm a Kabbalist, is heat bone the newt, which means kind of a focusing, right? Harnessing as opposed to heat bone the newt, which is more of a silencing. And, you know, you're talking more of a harnessing. And I think of it just in energetic terms. I really believe this stuff is real world, not otherworldly. Also, something like 80,000 thoughts a day come through my head, your head, 
right? Probably more in yours than mine, but we have thoughts, lots of thoughts. Question is, is you know, we can't follow all of those. We're not in charge. We're, we're out of control. I mean, you're describing like we're out of control. Can we take back control, our power? And my teacher, Dr. Viktor Frankl says, we have power over one thing, our ability to respond, right? And not live in reaction. Can I respond? Well, if I'm bombarded with 80,000 you know, distractions, I'm out of control. And, and you go to the gym, I think it's so awesome because you're in the arena. You're, you're, not, you're not doing it in a meditation center. You're putting yourself in the arena. Can I pay attention, harness my thoughts, harness my power, be in control of my right response. And that's a real, that to me, that's a, a real living meditation. Um, I was reading a chapter of Eckhart Tolle's book of the whole new earth, I believe. Is that the title? The whole, so. um, and it talked about the um, pain body. So these are the pain body are like these different triggers that have, um, oh, you, you know, maybe when you were a child, you, something happened and you have this like trigger now to where anything that happens that's kind of near that type of a um, um, experience, mm -hmm. you, you, you almost lose your mind. You, mm -hmm. you become in this reactive space. My dog woke me up at five in the morning and I was definitely not responding. I was very reactive and I wasn't happy and didn't give her the love that I normally would give her when I woke up. I was aggravated and I'm like thinking about it and I'm, and I'm reading this book. I'm like, that was such a trigger for me. Okay. How do I, how can I respond in those moments? How can I try to take back my power? Right. And not not be triggered by things that have happened to me in the past. Mm -hmm. Boy, oh, boy, that was um, that was something. So so but that's the work, you know, because you, I began by saying, is this normal? Of course, it's normal. We live in a we live in a fragmented world, a broken world. Things are not. That's why uh, Parker Palmer said in the real world, right? It can almost feel like wishful thinking that we live this whole undivided life, but we live in a divided world where things are broken and fragmented and fractured. And we're here to confront those. This is Kabbalah. We're here to confront those. And in Judaism, we call it tikkun olam. Maybe you've heard the expression tikkun olam, fix the world. But it's a much deeper process than just doing social action projects. Right. It's can I fix my own world? Well, how do I fix my own world by taking control of what I can, which is my brokenness? Right. What's broken in me? Because what your trigger and my trigger are different because we're different people. So, like, for instance, I'll, I'll share a little personal about you. I don't think it's exposing too much. And I think you reflect most people. You said there's a guy behind you coughing at the gym and it triggers you. Because we live in a COVID world where, and I know, you know, you have lots of um, reasons to be concerned about whether or not you're bringing this home or to your work or whatever. You're in, you're in pain body, right? Coughing now, probably three years ago, wasn't much of a pain body. You know, you've never really been a hypochondriac nearly as much as now you're very sensitive to the realities of COVID. And a cough is a spreader. This guy's a super spreader. I'm in my pain body. I'm going to carry that. My guilt, my, all of a sudden I'm in reaction. I'm in fear. That's brokenness, right? So that trigger, now the question becomes, and the work you're doing and the work we really talk about is, can I recover? Can I return, right? Can I take back my power and not go down this reactive path of fear, but take a deep breath, right? Not run from the gym, not run from the machine, I face my fear. To me, that is some of the work we're talking about. Does that resonate? Yes. And just really trying to, I think my mind has a tendency to potentially go down, and not so much right now, but in the past, it would go down this, just this rabbit hole, like you had mentioned. Oh my God, 
I'm going to get COVID, even though I actually had COVID a month ago. Okay. So I feel much more freer now, but oh my God, I'm going to get COVID and I'm going to take it home. And then, you know, kids and Amy, you know, something could happen there and I could spread it to people at work, blah, blah, blah. Like I'm not in that space right now, but I feel like that could, like I've prevented my myself from thinking that mm -hmm. and really just trying to catch that, that negative energy, that negative thought and really just come back to, okay, he's just coughing. It's okay. Like, mm -hmm. you know, and I've already, I've already had COVID. So there's, there's really, I, I should be fine. You know, my immune system should be strong. So just trying to level that out to where I am now responding versus what I have may have done in the past for, and reacted. That's power, authentic power, not this, you know, bullshit power of money and influence and all power over my ability to stand in my fear because it's fear. It's pain body. It's limbic. It's reptile brain. It's primitive. Like we don't want this shit. It just wells up within us over a trigger and I'm in fear. Can I stand? We talk a lot about the arena. This is my arena. Right. Your, your arena is not my arena. I have different fears. Can I stand? Can I take back my power and not go down this path of 10,000 thoughts, 10% of my life spent in this anxiety? Right. I'm going to come back, make my stand and not live in fear. And so many people I'm, I'm working with today are in such fear about COVID. Understandably, the question is, do we want to live in fear? Right. Or can we choose to be with less fear. I wouldn't say fearless, but less fear. And, and, you know, that's really what we're talking about. Um, and, and to me, that's power. I, yes. And, and, and really coming back to, you know, not worrying about what's going to happen, right. What could potentially happen, just be in this, in this moment, you know, and just being present in the now that's, we talk a lot about the present, right? Because there's no fear. Rarely is there fear, right? now like if you and i talking you can disengage and everything that's happening whether it's going to happen in a half an hour or it had happened a half an hour ago is irrelevant because we're we're connecting on this conversation on a deeper yes. thought and you know when i'm working with people um especially in grief it feels forever like it feels like it's never going to end and when you start going projecting forward like a life without your loved one. It's unbearable. But what I always do is bring them back. But right now, I'm not talking about a moment from now. Right now, are you okay? Well, yeah, right now I am. But no, come back mm. now. And we just got to own the now because we both know there's a tomorrow's a figment. Like, show me where is it? Where it's, is tomorrow? Doesn't exist. I, I'm gonna t I'm gonna talk about one of my biggest fears right now is my 16 year old is driving oh, so gabrielle is driving, and i just am having a really hard time with just her being out and about not knowing where she is and and these horrible thoughts creep into my head and i i have to learn to remove those horrible thoughts and really just think about what is happening now in, in, in this present moment. That is probably one of my biggest struggles. So there's two pieces to that as I've experienced and, and done work with people. I may have even talked about it in, on our previous podcast. I don't remember, but there's now, right? Because right now, you know, we would get into this whole thing of, you know, are you okay? Is she okay? And everything's okay right now. Well, what about tomorrow. Well, I'll come back to now and just really, and it's a muscle. I mean, you know that you've been doing a lot of work around the power of now and it's a muscle, but the other piece is your values, getting clear about your values, which is also an integrity issue. Most people walk around thinking they know their values, but not really knowing them. So let's play this out for a second. Did we talk about this on the previous podcast? Um, maybe, oh. but maybe not. Let's see. <laughs> We're doing it again. <laughs> All right. So when you're in that fear, right around okay. Gabriella's driving Gabriella, right not like mm -hmm. right Gabriella. Gabriella um when you're in that fear right what are you afraid of accident 
Okay. So the number one thing that you feel like is most important for Gabriella and you, your role as a parent is to provide safety. Yes. Make sure she's safe. That's your Would you say that's your number one value? I, I think, well, for my values, you know, my values are commitment, integrity, and gratitude. So I think safety probably falls into being committed to my, my daughter. Like, right? Like, okay. yes. Okay. So here, here's the truth. And you're not alone in this. The truth is we really haven't thought through. So the power of now really is more of a gut. Can I get my body and my gut here? And this work here is also the brain because, you know, you know, we're not just one intelligence. We have body, we have feeling and we have thinking. And so thinking is a very important part of this. So I would challenge you and say, it's not true that safety is your top priority for Gabriella. How do I know it's not true? Because if it was true, you wouldn't let her drive. That is true. Okay. Good point. Okay. What, is she, what does she drive? What type of car? My uh, old Honda Accord. Okay. Would you say that's a safe car? Yeah. I mean, I drove it for, you know, six or eight years. So is, would you great. imagine there's a safer car for her to be in? For sure. There's a safer car. 100%. It never ends. Like, okay, so let's get, let's get her a, a Ford Expedition. Well, wait a minute. But somebody else has a... Um, a Hummer beyond that. Like, let's get, let's put her in a tank. If you want her to be a hundred percent, put her in a tank. She'll love it. Right? That's a whole other fear, you know, not loading, her. but that's the only way to guarantee. No, you know what the better way is? Don't let her get her license. The better way, don't let her leave her room. But so my, my point though, why do you let her go out, drive, get into a Honda Accord and go? I want her, I'm trying to empower her and, and let her, live her life without me and me, Amy and I being a guide and overseeing and giving her advice. But I think it's important for her to make her own choices and decisions. But that's, that's, that shifts everything when you can come back to that and the fear starts kicking in, right? If she's out there, but wait a minute, I, Scott and I, her father want her to know freedom, want her to know, right? To, pursue her path, to go out into the world, to go into the arena, to support her knowing she's going to fall. Kids fall off jungle gyms and skin their knees, but we let them go up anyways. All right. So you start getting clear. You start journaling about why it's so important. Because my experience is when we do this, now the reward, the good outweighs the liability, the bad. And I can come back to Oh, but I want my kid to live and grow and pursue and have freedom, right? So these are just different strategies to come back to right now, right here. This is, this is amazing. This is good, right? And bringing down the noise, taking back our power. And so it's a great example. That's, that's a great way to, to process it and look at it as well. Is just giving her the ability to write her own story versus me telling her what to do. And I think I am absolutely not the only person that is concerned about this. I think that anybody that would watch this is probably can relate to this is probably our biggest concern as being a parent is letting them grow up and make their own decisions. You just don't know. Yes. And we've I've made a lot of bad decisions growing up. Some thank God somebody was overlooking me and looking over me to, you know, continue to keep me on this, you know, and on planet earth. Um, but I've made some really bad choices and decisions. And, but because of those, I think it has turned me into the person that I am today. So if I didn't have those mistakes and the, and didn't make those bad decisions, I probably wouldn't be sitting here right now with you. Yes. And think about the missed opportunities as well and not recreating those for our kids. So I'm not going to bring yours in. If I did, I might bring football, but I'll bring mine in. I'm uh, halfway through college with you, your fraternity brothers and friends in college. And then I, uh, I don't know if you remember, but I enlisted in the Marine Corps. I kind of remember that. Yeah. And my parents went ballistic, right? You know, Jewish parents, protective and they thought they were doing me a favor 
by getting it annulled, getting a psychiatrist involved, getting legal, you know, involved. Cause once you sign up, you sign up and mm -hmm. it was a whole to do. And, and, and in the end there was a technicality so that, but they, they didn't want me to go into the arena. That was my arena. I have lived for 20, 30 years now with regret. It's just mine. I don't you know, need to get rid of it, whatever, but there's this empty missing piece of me that I've always wanted to serve. Right. And if they would have sat down and done this work of the power of now and meditation and really just get, but he's okay. And we're okay. And if they would have gotten clear about their values, what they really want from me, their, their, their number one value was not to protect me. Right. That's a part of what they want from me, but they should also want for me to go out and pursue my dreams. And they didn't do this work. I forgive them. We've moved on. But, but that's why it's so important to get clear about what we really want from our kids and not, not from this reactive place of fear. Wow. Because it trickles down, right? Gabrielle will feel the fear if everything you're doing is afraid of her getting in the car. That stuff is accumulated. You know that. You've accumulated other people's fear. Yes. Yes. And, and I really try not to show her that and tell her that I'm afraid. You know, I, I really am trying to come from a place of empowering her and in, in, in doing what she needs to do as a teenager. But you're going a step further because you're not just hiding your fear, right? Which is a natural thing. I'm going to shield her from it. I'm actually, I, Scott, I'm going to deal with my fear. I'm acknowledging it instead of where I think in the past I would have ignored it. For would sure, I would have ignored it. And I would have thought I'm hiding it from others, but we're not, right? We can't. Our kids, our family, people who know us, they can feel the fear. And that's the next level of work that, you know, you're committed to and we're doing is I'm not only going to deal with my, I'm not only going to uh, not share my fear or spread my fear. I'm actually going to understand it. I'm going to look at it. I'm going to harness it. I'm going to get rid of it. I mean, that's the only way to remove it is to acknowledge it and, and hear and listen to it. But for so long, my whole life, I, I did ignore this piece. I did ignore that fear. And, and it's, like, it's like this whisper in your head. And we, I think maybe we talked about that in our last episode. You, you just got to pay attention to these whispers that are happening in your head. Yes. Because before you know it, that whisper is going to turn into somebody that's that whisper is going to be a screaming voice. Right. <laughs> so it's just I'm trying to really just pay attention to the, these things that are happening in the back of my head. And here's another quote from Parker's book. It's just I love this. I think about this all the time. I pay a steep price when I live a divided life, this, mm -hmm. this living in fear, feeling fraudulent, anxious about being found out, depressed by the fact that I'm denying my own selfhood. The people around me pay a price as well. For now, they walk on ground made unstable by my dividedness. Dividedness. How can I affirm another's identity when I deny my own? How can I trust another's integrity when I defy my own? A fault line runs down the middle of my life, and whenever it cracks open, divorcing my words and actions from the truth I hold within, things around me get shaky and start to fall apart. It's exactly what we're saying. I didn't know that we we're going to go down this path from the beginning of the, the first quote to the, this last quote, but I think, uh, you know, it's, it's pretty, um, it's just so important to, to, to recognize things and to hear that whisper and, and to acknowledge your fear and address it and try to um, be real about it and authentic about it. And I'll end with this, doing this work that you've been really committed to over the past few years, sometimes people, especially Enneagram 2s, which is another conversation, and Scott's an Enneagram 2, but it's a helper, other relationship-oriented type. It can feel selfish, self-indulgent, self-focused. And I would argue, I do argue all the time, especially with my 2s. I have a lot of 2s in my life. This is not selfish. This is self-centered. It's putting yourself back at the center because if you're not at the center, if you're not whole, if you're not the true you, then it's not the real you in relationship with Amy, with Gabriella, with your family, with your friends, with your clients. It's a version of you. So in fact, this is an act of service to them by you doing this work and putting yourself back at the center.
Do you agree with that? 100%. I mean, I think that in order for me to, I mean, I think it goes back to, um, you, you know, when you're flying in an airplane, a, airplane before they, you know, you know, make sure you put the mask on yourself before your child, you know, because you have to, you would never be able to save your child if you put the mask on her first and then because you're not there, you're not present. So I think it's so important for us to focus on ourselves and, and take care of ourselves in order for us to best serve our family, our friends, our clients, the people that are around us. And by going through this and, and this this journey that I've been on and, and working out and meditating and trying to, you know, reading and pod, listening to all these podcasts, it's, it's just bringing me to a more, more centered place to where I can I feel as though that I can, I'm able to, to, to help, you know, just to serve more and be, and that's, I think that's probably my Enneagram too as well. So, and that's this podcast and that's why, you know, you're doing it. I know is to um, just share if this can help somebody else. I know that you're all in and you, it's just how you're wired. I'm going to end with Parker Palmer's final quote. Wholeness does not mean perfection. It means embracing brokenness as an integral part of life. Knowing this gives me hope that human wholeness, mine, yours, ours, need not be a utopian dream if we can use devastation as a seedbed for new life. And that's really the work you've been doing is taking the broken pieces of your life, being honest, facing them, dealing with them, moving through them as an act of service to those around you. So thank you for doing this work, Scott. No, I, this is great. And, and just to add to that, I mean, I stumble. I still stumble. I mean, and I make mistakes, but I own them. OK, owning those mistakes, acknowledging that, apologizing in a very authentic, true way and forgiving yourself because I'm not perfect. That's right. And that's why we wake up every morning and it's called the work. Right. Yep. We do the work every day of our life. So. Um, if you're listening out there, take heart. Um, this is what a path with heart looks like, and it is possible, doable, and you can live a wholehearted life. Thank you for tuning into our second podcast, and I'm certain about this. It's not our last. <laughs> this is good. All right. Take Thank care. you. All right. See ya.